Have you tried kill all the poor? <laughs> Today I'm bringing you my top 11 tips to min-max your empire in order to get the most bang for your buck. Sit down, strap in, and let's dive into Stellaris. The first tip I have is useful right from the start of the game. And that tip is all about exploration. Now, when we select a science ship, if we send it off somewhere, we have two options. Either we can explore a system or survey a system. Now, depending on the number of guaranteed habitable worlds around you, you might be missing some of your guaranteed worlds, or there could be other worlds out there ripe and waiting for discovery. In this case, I have continental preference, and I can only see one continental world right next to my capital system. I am going to survey that one first, so I've finished the survey. I have a planet ready to begin colonizing, because I want to get my colonies up and running as soon as possible. But once I've surveyed this system, I need to start finding other worlds that will be habitable for my species. To do that, I'm going to have to send my science ship off into the unknown. When I do that, I should actually explore systems rather than surveying. This is going to mean I can travel around a lot faster and do some preliminary scouting, always on the lookout for potentially habitable worlds. When I finally find my second or indeed more habitable world, I can then start surveying those and also surveying the intervening systems between my current space and these worlds I want to reach out to. Fast scouting like this is essential in order to build up a plan of where the worlds you need to take are out in the galaxy. Whilst we have our science ship out surveying this world, which has a continental world, that is our preference, it will be very important to get a colony ship up and running as soon as possible. In order to do that, that brings us to my second tip, which is use the market. First off, you want to use the market here to make sure that you are producing as many resources as possible of the different types that you'll need to get a colony ship up and running without completely destroying your economy. To build my first colony ship, I require a whole host of consumer goods, alloys, and food, 200 of each. So I'm going to increase the amount I'm purchasing of some of the things I'm currently lacking, and I'm not going to buy that outright by clicking the buy button here. Instead, I'm going to set it up as an automatic trade. That will keep the price at a low and acceptable level. Now, there are some maximums you do not want to go beyond. If you go beyond these maximums for any good while you're in your internal market, the price will rise. As you can see here, if I continue to buy too many, the price will go up. And Therefore, every month when you come back to buy more, it will cost you more and more energy to buy more and more things. You don't just need to focus on buying though, you can also do some selling as well. Right now I'm going to show you the maximum amount you can auto buy or auto sell every month. Make sure to stay within these where at all possible. Once you've got enough here to start building a colony ship, I definitely recommend you get on with that, but don't forget to continue saving more so you can build a second, possibly even a third colony ship if you find the planets to colonize. After you've gone and built your colony ships, don't stop using the market. You'd want to continue using it to possibly purchase more minerals if you need them, or perhaps more consumer goods to support your early science-based economy. All of this was in the hope of getting our colonies down as soon as possible. That way we can turn them into profitable worlds that will be benefiting our empire as soon as we can. Stellaris is a game of small advantages, and every small advantage you can accumulate will help you to snowball and become more powerful than your neighbors and rivals. One important thing to think about here is how much it actually costs us to produce certain resources. So at the start of the game, depending on a few variables in your empire, it's often much more cost effective to produce energy credits and buy minerals instead than it is to directly produce minerals. As you can see here, our technicians are producing seven energy credits per pop, but only 4.6 minerals. Now at the market rate of 1.3 energy credits per mineral, we can get 5.38 minerals for these seven energy credits, which is more than the 4.6 minerals our miners can produce. So it's definitely a good idea to begin by expanding your technician and energy sectors and using that energy to buy more minerals than it is to simply expand and have more minor jobs for most empires. Once we have our colonies down, what do we actually do with them? Well, that brings me along to tip three, which is specialize your worlds. 
There are colony designations here, which when selected allow us to change the abilities and the bonuses our worlds will get. Generally speaking, there is a designation for every type of economic output that you would like from your worlds. It will either benefit them by reducing the upkeep of a specific job or increasing a job's output. In order to get the most out of your pops across your empire, you'll want to choose specializations for your colonies and stick to them. This world is relatively large for one of my guaranteed habitable worlds, and therefore I'm going to choose to set it as a factory world. Factory world is one of the weird specializations. Its twin is forge world, and the middle ground is industrial world. It shifts one of each of our industrial district jobs over from being an alloy producing job into an artisan. That means we'll get more consumer goods. I can quite quickly switch over to a forge world and then move in the opposite direction and have only metallurgists producing alloys if I want to. So what I'm going to do with this world is I'm going to specialize it explicitly as an industrial world, fill it up with industrial districts, start off as a factory world. Now that's going to be because I want to fill up on lots of consumer goods. And then maybe 10 to 15 years into the game, I'm going to switch it over to being a forge world. And at that point, I'll be trying to pump out lots and lots of alloys to produce lots and lots of ships. The other designation you'll probably want to use at the start of the game is tech world. You need more technology in order to get the ball rolling with your galactic civilization. So placing lots of research labs and of course additional city districts for more building slots to then place more research labs is very useful for your starting worlds. Your capital is in a bit of a special situation in that your capital doesn't get a specific bonus for being any one type of world. It gets extra stability, amenities and resources from jobs which basically means everything will make a little bit more. For that reason, you can throw down some research labs here. You can also build up more of your basic resource infrastructure, and that way you'll have lots of basic resources to fund further expansion. Don't be afraid if you need something, let's say you're running low on food and you're unable to purchase additional food from the market because you're already at that market maximum buy allowance every month, don't be afraid to build just one more district that isn't of the specific specialization you're going for if it will help balance your economy. But do keep in mind that you've done this and try to move possibly this agriculture district off world as soon as you can. And if you're enjoying these top tips, please cancel that like button. My next tip is don't overbuild. This is a trap that many newer players can find themselves landing into. They want to increase the size and scope of their economy, so they start building lots and lots of additional districts. Now districts will only add jobs and they'll have some form of upkeep. They usually don't produce anything outright. The same is of course true for buildings as well. In order to actually produce anything, we need pops working those jobs. So what you'll want to do is reduce your available jobs all the way down to basically zero if you can get away with it. And then we'll try to preempt unemployment by making sure we have possibly one job available or begin building a district or building before this next pop grows or is assembled. This way we can minimize our upkeep and state expenditure on all of these jobs while maximizing the productivity and production of the pops or people in our empire. Having a firm grasp of your economy does sometimes require a little bit of micromanagement. And that means we'll want to go to the population tab here and start expanding out each of these lenses so that we can have a more direct control on which jobs are actually available. A personal hatred of mine would be for both the clerk job and the farmer job. We're going to want to use the increase and decrease job priority to remove pops from working these bad jobs and instead go up to work something much more productive like a researcher or even just a humble technician or minor. You can use the increase and decrease job priority to remove pops from working jobs that you don't want to currently have active. Possibly, for example, in the early game, I actually don't want to spend that many of my minerals on alloys, so I will decrease the job priority for metallurgists. Yes, this will reduce my overall alloy output, but I'll have more minerals to spend, which I need for building districts and, of course, building more buildings. Strong leadership is important to improve your empire. 
From an economic perspective, that means we want to have good governors and good scientists. Generally speaking, right at the start of the game, the best governor we can get our hands on is the architectural interest governor. That's going to reduce our building cost, district cost, and increase all build speed. This is a fantastic governor to put down, thereby slightly and marginally increasing our economic development and reducing the cost of that development. All of these minor bonuses will add up, so you definitely want to look out for them. On the flip side of this, having a governor like an intellectual governor employed when you're not constructing things or in between after you've purchased the new building and therefore paid the reduced building cost but are now simply waiting for it to be constructed, you can improve your research output of all researchers by 10% on every world in this sector. That is a really good bonus to have at basically the cost of a small amount of unity and a little bit of micromanagement. There's also one very important type of governor that you'll only get your hands on after researching interstellar fleet traditions. That is the retired fleet officer governor. Retired fleet officers give you a reduction in shipbuild cost and increased shipbuild speed. Retired fleet officers are essential when you want to build up a navy in minimizing the overall cost of that navy project. So make sure you get your hands on one of these before you start building up a navy. There is of course also the researchers in our empire. Now scientists do research. We can employ one scientist for each research type. Every technology also has a type. In this case assembly patterns is the industry type. This means that if we get an industry expertise specialist as a researcher doing this research, we'll get a bonus to research speed. So in this case, I'm only getting a base of around 75 research every month, but I'm getting an additional 34% on top of that, rounding me out at just over 100. It can also be a good idea to have multiple scientists available for the more important technology types. This is generally most useful in engineering and physics. In engineering, where we want to have the industry and possibly the expertise Voidcraft researchers. And in physics, where we'll want particles as well as computing specialties. Those are the two, generally speaking, most important. By matching up the scientist to the expertise, we will, of course, improve. Now, there are two extra expertises that are generalist. We've got maniacal, which gives us 5% extra, and genius, which does the same but gives us 10%. Those are great to have as all-rounders that can be swapped into slots if you don't have a, for example, biology expertise specialist at your disposal. You do need to be careful though. The more leaders you recruit, the higher the cost becomes for each leader you then want to employ. So you probably only want to have possibly one additional governor and one or two available extra scientists. Don't go too far beyond that, especially if you don't have the unity to buy them and upkeep them. If you're enjoying this video and you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by purchasing something from the Humble Bundle store or buying a piece of Montu Play's merchandise. List all of that down in the description below. You also need to remember to keep track of and use your policies. This can be as simple as at the start of the game, moving from expansionist to isolationist in order to get your hands on a juicy plus 10% unity. And that means you'll get your traditions out ever so slightly faster than your neighbors. Or later on, moving from isolationist into supremacist when you unlock the supremacist tradition in order to get a whopping 20% additional naval capacity, reduce your claim influence cost, reduce war exhaustion gain, and on top of all of that, get a whopping plus 100% diplomatic weight from fleet power if you're going to engage in any interstellar politics. Your economic policy is also one to watch out for. Generally speaking, at the very start of the game, I'd recommend moving over to something of a civilian economy. That's going to mean you can produce lots of extra consumer goods, yes, at a decrease to output from alloy jobs. But then around year 15, possibly 20, if you're playing in PvP, or just when you're ready to start building up your navy and building up your alloy production, then switch over to a militarized economy, have reduced consumer good output, as long as you've got a big store saved up, you shouldn't be bothered for at least five or 10 years, and get a whopping 25% additional alloy output from jobs. If you're a mercantile nation, trade policy is definitely something you'll want to mess around with. And don't forget to pick the war doctrine that will best assist you in the wars to come. Just underneath policies, we have something else you need to make sure that you don't overlook, and that is edict. 
Now, first off, during peacetime, actually all year round, you will have an edict fund at your disposal that can be used to spend fake unity on some of these economic edicts. Some of the best ones increase our base resource production. For example, capacity subsidies and mining subsidies both increase basic resource output, or in the case of mining subsidies, also strategic resource gatherer output. And if you have the unity to spare, this is almost free, except possibly there might be some upkeep effects from the specific edicts. But basically, don't forget to use up your edict fund. Depending on how much unity you're producing, you may not want to go too much over your edict fund, but that is always an option if you really need the extra economic output. Aside from just our peacetime edicts, we also have the military edicts as well. Most of these are accessed by having rare resources, so exotic gases, volatile moats, and rare crystals. The most powerful amongst these are focusing crystals, giving us a plus 25 energy weapon damage, volatile explosives, increasing our explosive weapon damage, volatile ammunition, increasing our kinetic weapon damage, reactive armor to boost our armor hit points, exotic gases for shields to boost our shield hit points, and if you really, really need it, you can also get a nice 15% boost to sublight speed by using exotic gases as fuels. Make sure that you do turn on whatever of these edicts you can afford to run while you're at war. They're going to massively increase the damage and threat potential of your navy. So it is essential that you don't forget to turn on your edicts when you're fighting in combat. If you really want to micro this, you could turn it on only when you're just about to engage in a fight and turn it off immediately after the fight is done. That will minimize your actual expenditure of these rare resources. Speaking of forgetting things, don't forget to build or upgrade more star bases into starports throughout your empire. That will give you access to buildings like a hydroponics bay, allowing you to produce food off planet. This can be so essential and useful for moving from an agrarian based economy at the start of the game. Technically are, I suppose, you do have some farmers out there, I've seen them, over into an entirely industrial economy that doesn't have to produce its own food via working, it will get it from star bases that just seem to pull it out of thin air. Regular bio empires will only really have access to things like trade hubs or anchorages for more economic benefit. But if you're a hive mind empire, you can throw down solar panels, which just flat produce energy, and they are absolutely amazing. Even going slightly over your starbase capacity can still be worthwhile if you're using these starbases for economic benefit. In this case, I'm spending 1 plus 25% 1.25 energy credits to produce 11 food. That is phenomenally better than anything I could get on the market or actually anywhere else in the game. It is actually even more efficient than the Fallen Empire building which produces food. In order to get the most bang for your buck, you're going to want to turn off auto-generated designs and instead design your own ships for maximum effectiveness. This way you can both design more effective ships than the AI could and balance your ships to fight whichever opponent you happen to be coming up against if you have some intelligence on their ship designs. I won't be doing an in-depth design review in this video, but that will be coming soon. So if you're interested in seeing it, let me know down in the comments below. When your ships are designed and you've got an alloy pile ready to be spent, now it's time to start building ships. In this case, we can use a bit of a special trick in order to minimize the actual upkeep and cost of building ships. What we're going to be doing is waiting until the day gets down to very, very low using shift and moving the currently constructing ships to the bottom of the queue. This means that those ships will not use any upkeep, they will use absolutely no resources, so your production of resources will be at a maximum while constructing your fleet. And when you finally get to the end of building up your queue, all of these ships will pop out roughly at the same time. This has two advantages. The first being that, as I mentioned, you'll have absolutely no upkeep costs on these ships, because if I were to let them just build, I'd then be having to pay the fixed upkeep costs of ships. 
For small ships, that's not so much, but as your ships get larger and more expensive, the cost in energy and alloys can increase quite a lot. Now the other benefit is, if we decide that we simply don't need a navy, I can simply left click on these ships and stop constructing them and get a full refund. Yes, this trick is a little bit fiddly, but it will save you an absolute bomb on ships. It's mainly important if you're playing in PvP. I hope these tips can help you to improve the efficiency of your empire out there in the galaxy. If you need some more basic information, or a beginner's guide in fact on Stellaris, look no further than my Complete Idiot's Guide to Stellaris 3.4, which should walk you through all of the basics and menus in the game. Check that out by clicking the video on screen now.